usually in these kind of systems, those are the guys that are auditing, so the, those guys that are good listeners, uh, they listen during the they raise their hand uh, in the end of the, 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 the class and uh, reproduce that quickly and they get five days or whatever you have in, in Albania. And those that, that are not such good listeners, they get marks uh, later, probably a bit harder. But it's again a lot of you know, learning by heart and uh, just learning the content that is there by, by the program. And it's not only that. So I'm going to make a few assumptions here about the education system in Albania and you tell me if I'm wrong. So it's focused on procedures, not kids. So there you go. Uh, people nodding here. So teachers, uh, instead of uh, working with you guys and uh, you know talking to you, uh, they have to make plans, they have to uh, make reports, I see not even again. <laughs> they have to get points uh, because uh, the, you know, the system says by, by the law uh, the teachers have to improve every year. And how they improve? They get the points by going on different education. Maybe this conference is even bringing points to, to teach. There you go. <laughs> but uh, this, this is good company, yeah? <laughs> and from a good looking guy. <laughs> um, what else? As I, as I mentioned, it's focused on knowledge and the interpretation of this knowledge. So uh, the system that the, the government tells you, this is what you need to know. This is exactly what you need to know at this age. We don't want you to know any more any less than that. This is what you need to know. And have you ever heard of anything good that happens when government says you need to do that? Because this is what happened. And this kind of system is usually very slow. So when we hear you know, about, uh, uh, for example, great uh, uh, successes of Nordic countries on uh, PISA West, we go to them and say, hey, we want to be like you guys. And we take your system and we reform our system to, so to be like the Finland one. Probably Albania will try the same, like Serbia. But as this reform goes on, it lasts for, I don't know, five, ten years, and it's already old, and since uh, our system is focused on procedures and uh, uh, reports and plans, it doesn't really uh, replicate the system in Finland, but it kind of adapts it to our current culture and system. So it never really happens, this, this change. So in Serbia we have uh, Finnish and Swedish and US, all kinds of reforms that we did, but still on these tests we are getting worse and worse. And parents are not involved enough in education. So some, some, can, some say that the parents don't have time for this. And, uh, you know, we send kids to school because we don't want to educate them. I mean, it's the system, you know. It's, uh, we send them to school so that we don't have to educate them. But in today's world, this is not the case. Because the, the, the change is so big and so fast that both parents and kids have to learn together. Because it's not that parents are anymore like uh, when I was uh, a kid, uh, what I was learning in school was pretty much the same like what my parents were learning. Nothing changed there. So they don't say it. And then they tell that they can support you and help with uh, you know, math and, and, and stuff. But today, what needs to be in schools is new also for parents. So parents cannot help anymore. So parents need to be involved in order to understand the education system so that they can uh, learn probably easier uh, than, than, than the kids and then help the kids. So what is happening? So the, 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 I, I want to emphasize this, like uh, what kind of a world are we living in? So we have a world of fake news. We have the world of uh, uh, huge data privacy issues where, you know, the companies like the Cambridge Analytica are analyzing a bunch of data from Facebook and uh, understanding you know, how we think, how we uh, do stuff uh, like uh, uh, Providing you with information uh, in, in order to, to that when you become voters, you vote for somebody they like you to, to vote for, or to buy products that they want you to, to buy. And this is because uh, we, we are now kind of accepted that we live in a world where uh, data is open and data is everywhere, so we cannot care about that. But we should. Then uh, probably YouTube is great in in, in Albania too. Uh, all the YouTubers are doing a lot of money. Don't know the, the scene in, in Albania that much, but in uh, Serbia we have uh, YouTubers that are about 20 years old or so buying uh, Lamborghinis, Porsches, uh, apartments, I don't know, like really a lot of money. And when brands approach them 
Uh, they, they don't even want to work with, with brands, you know, to promote them unless they offer them five or ten thousand euros for starters, and then they, they negotiate. It's ridiculous how much you can do uh, today without, you know, proper education, school, everything. It's, uh, you just go on YouTube and if you're creative and if you're uh, talented for that, you can earn money. Uh, new type of money is, is, is booming. So, cryptocurrency, I don't want to get into, into the detail of currency, but uh, uh, the important thing is that this is not regulated by national banks or, or government. And this makes it so big and such a big change that, that, that uh, I'm not sure how uh, national banks and governments will, will deal with it. They are trying, but, but I really don't think this is probably the, the biggest change that is happening due to the world currency. We are losing some repetitive jobs. Like if, uh, if we uh, get out of the education system as we were supposed to, because this system was uh, uh, our education system is created to make, well, not cheap, but labor. So, it's, uh, you know, you finish your high school or you finish your university, you get out and you find a job. This is what my, uh, my dad was telling me uh, when we moved to, to, to Belgrade as a refugee from Kosovo. Tell me, look, now you just finished high school. Uh, it's my job to go to university. If uh, army was still mandatory there, if you have to go to army, to go to army. And then when you finish all that, you find a job and you're on your own. So, and this is the system that they lived in for like decades and decades. You, you finish school, you find a job and that's it. You set one, one job or in one company, maybe you grow a bit vertically, maybe you try something else, but you probably stay most of your life in one company. And the, so you are labeled, like you, that, that there is no uh, any sense of entrepreneurship or trying something new in this system. And now, these people are under a huge threat because AI and machine learning are taking over their jobs. So if they were in admin or, or finances, it's very likely that the next five or ten years they, they will actually lose their job. So they need to reinvent themselves. And have you heard about Snapchat before? Don't, don't Google it now. <laughs> but I, I want to emphasize the importance of it. And this is uh, why I, I think that parents and kids have to learn together today and that the education system, ideal education system, uh, will integrate parents into, into learning. Because, uh, you know, when, when I was young, when uh, there was no internet and stuff, if I made something, you know, bad, if I got drunk and somebody, you know, found me in the middle of the street, or if I, uh, you know, while being drunk, uh, you know, destroyed something, some cars, like that, not that I did that, but I did that. Um, probably, you know, even if I was arrested, nobody would know. I mean, everybody in my city will know, and that they will maybe make fun of me. But two years later, nobody knows about that. Even worse, if uh, something happened, and this uh, happens a lot, when, you know, uh, if you're a young girl, and, uh, uh, you know, you fall in love with an older guy, like you are, you know, um, first year of high school, and he's fourth year, you know, he's a uh, hot shot in school at the time, you fall in love, you're easily manipulated, and uh, he makes a video of you, like a sexy video of you, and if this goes internet, it's there forever. It's like, you're, it's not like that, that, that your life is ruined just in this school or in this city, because if this happened uh, 20 years ago to, to me and my generation, like, you know, this video would disappear very soon, if, even if, if it was a video or, or a photo, it would disappear. But now, when you put something on the internet, it's there forever. And especially be, be uh, very careful about Snapchat and TikTok and all these uh, uh, tools today, social networks that you use, where you feel uh, it's created to make you feel safe about the content because, you know, it disappears after 24 hours and stuff, and uh, you know if somebody takes a big screen and stuff like that. But it's not really like that. Actually, you, you, you can download uh, these videos uh, that you don't even know that you downloaded. And uh, that people take these videos, if you make a sexy video or so, and they, they sell them on porn sites, your videos, and they stay there forever. So please uh, make sure that, that you care about that. So I'm saying that now, uh, even myself, that I, I, I really uh, think that I'm digitally illiterate and uh, that I'm uh, you know, kind of proactive and, and uh, that I know myself still. I need to keep learning with my kid because he gets involved in new stuff, some, some different stuff that I 
don't know. And uh, like now I, I, I realize like uh, someone says, oh, the TikTok is now the biggest social network and the most other social network. I never used it because I find it weird and stupid. But that just means that I'm old, not that it's actually stupid. So I am old and I have to keep learning with my son. So we have some, so I, I don't want to, to, to say that everything is dark and that uh, nothing, nothing works. So we have some reactions. And you could see yesterday that you have a fantastic commitment of uh, a university and uh, uh, government officials in the room, plus Elvis that is leading this initiative. This is amazing. In Serbia, we have a fantastic uh, uh, initiative uh, that, that, that uh, puts coding and programming in, in primary schools. If I had to be piloted in 40 schools, but uh, uh, it will be uh, rolled out in schools uh, next year or the year later. Uh, what is so good about it is that not only that uh, kids or young students will learn how to code the program. That's not the idea. But uh, the idea is that uh, uh, you learn uh, about algorithms and algorithm way of thinking. Because whatever you do in the future, you will have to understand algorithm way because you will learning AI and uh, all different kinds of tools or uh, I mean you will have to use it in your work whatever you do as HR marketing uh, uh, production whatever so the important thing is that that, uh, uh, that you learn it and as far as I hear that uh, there will be coding very soon next year pilot will go in Albania very happy about that and why I'm especially happy about that is that uh, this uh, yeah do that uh, this is a good way to start thinking about how education system should look like. Because as I said, we don't want education system that uh, uh, provides labor. Because if we provide labor uh, as, as, as a system, this labor will go to Germany, will go to the US, will go where uh, somebody pays more money for, uh, for what you do. And the, the problem there is that not that our education system is bad. Because, you know, when you go to, from Serbia or Albania, when you go to Germany or the U.S., they usually say, wow, you guys are really skillful. Like, you know your stuff. You're so good at math. You're so, uh, everybody speaks English almost perfectly. This is amazing. Like, how do you guys do it? Like, maybe we should replicate your education system. But yes, if you want to keep creating labor. And if we keep creating labor, the political and social situation in our region will push these people towards the West. This is how migration works. This is, the, 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 that's it. So we need to reset ourselves and we need to uh, use what we have good and start creating as our region, as Balkans, uh, start creating something because now we live in a globalized, uh, 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 all network world, use what we have, use the, the, the thing that we are still not uh, uh, expensive as, as, as a region and we can dominate the world actually from, from our region. This is uh, why I believe that I, I actually I lived uh, in the West, I lived in Vienna for some time, I lived in Istanbul, worked for uh, Microsoft. Uh, I, I've seen how that works. And I'm quite sure that, that, that uh, if we keep talking in Balkans, we can, make a, we can be the next big thing in the world. So, I spoke uh, about uh, my little project uh, called Superheroes uh, some time ago on the TEDx event in, in Belgrade. And this is, uh, I'm trying to promote uh, the essence of how education system uh, should work with kids. So, I don't want to talk about content yet. So, this is just the essence. What kind of kids do we want to have? So, we want to have kids with their two legs strongly on the ground, where one is critical thinking, so you need to challenge everything. We need you to, when you talk about um, history or when you talk about math, uh, not to just replicate uh, of how the math problem is being solved, but to challenge that and try to find a new way. Or, or, or uh, if somebody says like, so uh, Napoleon did a good thing when he did that. Try to challenge that, to, to, to discuss with, uh, with kids as, as a teacher. This is very important that we have to uh, keep our kids curious. I think you guys, if you uh, make sure that, that you stay curious, that, that you constantly learn about new stuff, that you don't feel like, uh, you know, I can't uh, uh, do anything because, you know, I live in a small city in Albania or I live in a small city in Kosovo or Serbia or Montenegro, doesn't matter. Uh, it's not worth my time, actually. Whatever I do, it's not going to change things. Yes, it will. 
because we live in a uh, really uh, global, globalized world where everybody has the, the, the same chance. And then you have to uh, be responsible for your knowledge with both your hands, grab uh, the opportunity and be responsible with it. Be responsible about your personal development, be responsible about what you have in your hands. And then the head, self-awareness. You need to be aware of what you know, you need to be aware of uh, 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 what's your capacity and what you know, what you don't know, what you need to learn. This is very, very important and we don't do this in, in schools. Like we grade kids, we grade you guys based on the interpretation of, of some knowledge that government said you, you need to know. But we don't tell you, hey, but this is not enough. You don't know this and this, so maybe you should start learning. So self-awareness is very, very important. And if we have this kind of kids, if we, you know, put you guys a cake that says self-confidence on it, you become a superhero. Because I really, really believe that uh, uh, nobody in our region should feel, and we often feel like that, feel that, uh, you know, we are third world uh, uh, countries when it comes to, you know, to EU. EU usually uh, sends us these messages and, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies from the West come to our region, use us as cheap labor, and this affects our culture and affects our minds. And we need more self-confidence and it's just by understanding that we are the same, that we actually have same talents and same opportunity like somebody in the US or Germany or, or Austria or Australia or wherever. And when we have this little superhero, right, uh, we need some skill sets. And uh, this is where I want to uh, talk again about literacy. So what is the literacy uh, today? I again want to emphasize that both parents and kids should learn together. First, sociology. I know maybe maybe somebody expected IT programming and stuff, but uh, in the old connected world where you know we are born with our cell phones and where uh, we will have coding in schools and all that, uh, understanding the world around us has never been so important. Understanding how uh, uh, networks and communities work on a global scale is important because if you understand them, then you understand what can happen on Snapchat, what can happen on different social networks, you can protect yourself. Then we have digital literacy. Because, you know, usually uh, they'll say, like, ah, digital literacy, you know, they are born phones that they know how to use them. Yes, you know how to use it, you know how to take a photo, you know how to install a game and stuff like that, but this is not enough. Safety is an important part of, of digital literacy, for example, and we don't pay much attention to it. And uh, uh, I know, uh, you know, some, some of my friends that are parents, a bit older kids than mine, like they are, what, 11, 12, 13 years old, maybe some of you are like that. And uh, uh, th there was a, a little scandal in school, uh, something with uh, Instagram and, uh, I don't know, some selfies and whatnot. And the reaction of, of my, my friend was to take the phone from his daughter and to not allow her and kill her Instagram account. Now, like, dude, like, what the hell? Like, what, what, what? what? What that's supposed to mean? Like, she won't be on Instagram because, you know, I don't want her to be like this 13-year-old uh, uh, kid. <laughs> like, but, man, if you take phone from her, she will do that just on somebody else's phone. So somebody else will own these, these, these photos and maybe uh, they will be leaked somewhere and then what? So the, the, the point of digital literacy is not to uh, just know how to use phone. It's a bit more than that. Then we have financial literacy. When I was young, we did everything in cash, right? So we didn't have bank accounts, we didn't have online banking, uh, uh, you know, online payments and all that. Today, everybody, like, uh, I mean, even my kid knows that, that you know, when uh, he's five years old and uh, he knows that on his tablet, uh, uh, when he wants to, to, to buy a new levels, he needs my credit card. So he told me, like, hey, you, have to, you know, click because it's connected. Obviously, and when he clicks, I have to approve to my phone. And he comes with the approve, approve, I want new levels. Like, I mean, he, he knows that, but, but education system does not recognize that. Like, we don't have financial literacy in schools. Nobody teaches you uh, anything about uh, how our financial system works, like uh, what, what are banks there for and stuff like that. And then two more most important things for creating an entrepreneurship uh, mind in, in, in you is, first is information and media literacy. I mentioned fake news before, and uh, probably opinion is, again, pretty much the same, like in Balkan and other Balkan countries, is that, uh, uh, we 
are flooded by, by tabloids and, and fake news everywhere. And uh, if you, uh, I mean, for example, if you read news in uh, Belgrade and Pristina every day, like if you just see the, 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 the coverages, you will think that we are on the verge of a war. Literally, like uh, uh, we are, I don't know, in some cases, like uh, uh, Russians are coming to help us, uh, Germany wants with uh, uh, Pristina and Kosovo to start a new war. And like, you the war is coming, you know, my parents are calling me like, hey, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't go to Albania because, you know, something is happening. Like, what? And we need to understand that this is happening. That, that, that uh, if we, it's not like 20 years ago where uh, you would read where, you know, journalists were still journalists and not just a tabloid writer that, that uh, are after clicks and, 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 and helps. Because this brings money, obviously. Um, you need to learn how to read news, you need to learn, and it's not just news and media, it's the world around you, you need to understand your world, to, to get all the information, to process it, and to get something out of it. When you do that, and if you are able to adapt to this situation, and if you, are adapt, if you, are, uh, if you understand that sometimes you, you need to take a few steps back and unlearn something that you learn, maybe in school, maybe in your family, and learn it again, learn something how, how it's done in a different way, then the magic happens. Then you are able to fix what pisses you off. Because this is how entrepreneurship works. Something pisses you off, you fix it through a business. Or you see something that you don't feel it's good enough, you create another business to improve that. I give you just a few examples. Fishing booker from, from Serbia. It's like uh, a friend of mine that uh, he likes fishing, right? And uh, he likes traveling as well. So he wanted to travel to Florida and uh, uh, he thought, hey, while well, there, you know, maybe I go fishing. And uh, he tried to, to Google for fishing boats and he couldn't find any. And he thought, is it possible that, that I cannot book fishing from here and I have to go to Florida and then I lose my, my time, waste my time there to, to look for fishing boats? And he was like, no, no, this, this cannot be possible. And he couldn't find, so he created the shipper. Currently, uh, it, like only two years later, uh, it's like uh, 100 people in this company completely run from, from Belgrade, and they have uh, fishing boats everywhere in the world. You can uh, literally, probably, I don't know if uh, Amazon has a, a river or something, even if not, maybe he even has uh, you know, uh, fishing boats here because they, they really have fishing boats everywhere. He just fixed a problem, he found a problem and fixed it, and earned a lot of money out of it. Then you have Nordic. Uh, uh, Serbia has become quite big in the, in the region uh, as a gaming hub. So we have uh, many big game developer companies in, in, in Belgrade. Nordis was one of them. It's a couple of guys that uh, worked for Microsoft actually in Denmark. Uh, they were those guys that uh, created like the of our education system. They left because they, they found out that they will not earn enough money by working for certain companies. They went to Microsoft in Denmark, worked there for some time, then realized that, uh, you know, they are gamers as well. And football, just like, you know, Benia in Serbia is very popular, and uh, I don't know if you guys play, but, you know, football manager and these kind of games are always popular in Serbia. And they said, hmm, yeah, but, you know, if you want to play football manager, you have to, uh, you know, buy a disc or buy an expensive game that you install on your laptop, and if your laptop is a bit older, then uh, after a few years, you know, this database becomes so, so, so big and so on. I thought we'd do it online because, you know, there is Facebook now, so why don't we create a Facebook game? So they quit their jobs, they created uh, Top Level, which is uh, now the most played uh, football manager, online football manager game in the world. They also uh, have some other games, but this is the, the one that uh, uh, gets a lot of money uh, for, for, for them. And then, yes, you know, Damien, you have Girafa. They also fixed a huge problem and it's a great example of uh, uh, what you should do, you know, just find a problem and fix it. And before managing to, to, to create such a big business, and this is where I will uh, end my presentation today, uh, you can, I, I, I was checking last night, and I realized that, you know, Benia, there are not so many uh, freelancers, which is weird. It's uh, like a, in Serbia, I think uh, almost 5% uh, of, of uh, all our inhabitants are currently online freelancers. Because if you speak English and 
since you're here, I suppose, you're speaking. And if you know how to use a computer, you are already halfway there. Go to Upwork, register there, see what kind of jobs are there, because there is everything from, uh, you know, inserting stuff, for simple stuff into some database, to graphic design, to creating videos, whatever. See what, uh, what the market is asking. So this is global market. And try learning what you are interested in, and try learning of how, how to do it, and then offer yourself in the market. Pretty soon you will start earning money, because the need for freelancers is so huge, that is amazing. Like some IT companies in Serbia now are struggling to find IT people, developers, and all kinds of like designers, everybody, because they don't want to work for one company anymore. You know, they go to Upwork, they earn more money there than by working uh, this. And when you start working on Upwork, when you feel this uh, independence, that, that uh, independence from the system that is so hard trying through all your years of education to put you in labor, to put you in, in workforce, now you feel independent and you don't go back. You create businesses. I used to work in a corporate world. Actually, I used to work in all three sectors. I worked for the government, I worked uh, in NGO sector, I worked in the corporate sector, on local, national, international level. And then when I quit and when I became an entrepreneur, it's really, really like the best feeling ever. So here I am. If you uh, want, I will be here all day. If you want any, you know, advices, if you want to, to, to talk to me about like how to, if you have any, any questions, please approach me. Thank you so much for all of you here today. I don't do this professionally. As I said, I work as a, or as a, I was introduced to work as a software developer, so not as a professional speaker or anything. So bear with me. Um, yeah, I'm from Germany. Um, this is my first time in Albania, actually. So for me, it was really hard to prepare this talk to be held in a country that I don't know a lot about because I only know stuff about Albania from Wikipedia and from some very weird YouTube videos that I found. Um, so before I start to talk, I actually want to get an idea of your state of mind, and what you guys have as a background, and what you think. Um, so I'll ask you a couple of questions, and I ask you to raise your hands if you um, if you feel um, that you should do that. So, um, oh yeah, other thing I need to say, um, I'm going to be very uh, not very precise with all the vocabulary. So everything I say today will be under the name of computer science. Actually, there's more sub-genres. I'll talk about computer engineering, stuff like that. But today, everything is computer science. So if you're studying already something, sorry, it's not going to be very precise. Um, so questions. How many of you have, have um, already considered to work in IT later once you're done? You just <coughs> show your hands. OK, thanks. Um, and the second question, how many of you actually do or will, I don't know, I mean, if you can foresee that it will happen in the future, some kind of computer science, IT-related education in school? 
Oh, actually, there's a couple of them. Interesting. Because this would look bad in Germany as well, so no worries. Um, Germany is pretty backwards in that way as well. Um, and also another question maybe, could you just throw me some words, just screen them out at me, no need to raise your hands, of associations that you have when you hear the word computer science? Just screen them at me. What do you think of? Nurse? Good one. More. Sorry? Full stack. Good one. All right. What was that? Blockchain. Okay. Nice. So these are actually what? Bitcoin. Oh yeah, nice one. Uh, so these are actually all pretty recent terms. So that's that's pretty good. I didn't know you know what I was to expect here, but this seems like you have actually a good idea of what's what's going on in computer science. Um, so thanks for this insight um, and for giving the idea of what you think about. Um, now I'll tell you a little bit more about me. Um, I'm Moritz. I'm 29 years old. I grew up in Nuremberg, Bavaria. Oh, that's actually because I'm 29. Um, I grew up in Nuremberg, Bavaria, which is in the south of Germany. Um, it looks a little bit like this. And in school, I sucked at math and physics. Um, I'm not proud of it, it's just the fact. This is actually, oh, sorry, that was one too far. This is actually my year board from grade nine. I know you probably won't be able to read it, but if you look at mathematics, physics, five, it's like an E if you grade from A to F. So in Germany, it's one to six, so this is like horrible. I actually failed this year, so I had to repeat this school year in the class because it was so bad in math and physics. Um, and after graduating school, so I managed to graduate school, um, but after graduating it, I did not go to university right away. Um, only when I was 24, I decided to study computer science, um, and I studied technical computer science, which is like, if you have all those genres of computer science, that's the one with most math and physics in there, so don't ask me why I did it, but it worked. Um, so technical computer science has a lot of electrical engineering, uh, we are like the guys who work with hardware and software, um, and make them work together. Um, and now I work as a front-end software developer in Hamburg, so if you don't know what a front-end is, that's fine. The front end is the part of the software that the users interact with or that the users work with. So everything you click on, that's that's the front end, that's what I built. Um, yeah, and just a second. Yeah. So oh yeah, that's actually my degree, never mind. Um, I am still very much privileged and uh, still represent a lot of cliches about computer science. Uh, there's also quite a lot of ways that I differ from the stereotype of a computer scientist. Um, I was not a natural born nerd who started programming at a very young age, so I didn't, you know, spend my childhood in front of a computer. Well, I did, but I didn't program, you know, I did other stuff. Um, also, I'm pretty sociable, like, I like to go out. I don't like to sit in front of the screen all day. It's actually not that enjoyable for me. I mean, sometimes it is, but I also like to go out and, you know, see nature and meet friends, whatever. And as I already said, I always struggled with math and physics. I'm no uh, natural born a scientist or whatever. Um, and computer science was not my first career choice. So you remember that I said I started studying it before. I actually became a trained journalist before that. But that turned out to be dead and broke. So now I'm a computer scientist. And I started studying rather late. So I was um, 24 when I started, and most of my classmates or my, my uh, fellow students were like 17 or something, so that was pretty weird, but it worked out very well in, in the end. Um, because of that, because I don't really fit the mold of computer scientists perfectly, um, I hope I can give you something that you can take away that maybe you see that you don't fit the mold as well, but that doesn't really matter because there is no mold. This is what I'm going to tell you. Um, oops, too far. So let's talk about who can work in computer science. Um, you would think that actually um, only people who are good with math and physics, and I already told you I'm not good with it, so it's not true, trust me. Um, yes, there is a lot of math in computer science, um, and if you want to dig deeper, it's still there, so if you're a math nerd, go do computer science, it's awesome. Um, especially math with the ones and zeros and all that stuff, it's the foundation of computer science. Um, but thankfully, other people figured that out for us, 
the, the math part, and we don't need to think about it anymore. What work is to be the scientist. So you get by pretty much without a lot of math um, if you work as a developer every day. Um, and yes, if you want to get a degree in computer science, there will be math in every computer science program. No way around it. Doesn't matter where you study it, there will be math. Um, so if you want to study it, yeah, you should arrange yourself with math. You don't have to be good at it, but um, trust me, it's manageable. I did it. That was really bad. It's okay. You can get by. And math in uh, a computer science program is different than math in your secondary school or whatever. So, another thing that people might think about computer scientists is that only people who got a university degree in computer science can work in computer science. That's, again, not true. Actually, in Silicon Valley, which is the epicenter of the computer science world, no one cares about your degree anymore. Really, no one cares. All the big companies that we call problems like GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, people, uh, companies like that, they don't look for degrees anymore, they look for skill. So they actually abandon all that stuff, you can apply there without a degree, it doesn't matter as long as you have skill. Um, and this is true for every computer science job that I ever applied to or that, ever, that I ever saw. When you can convince people that you're skilled, it doesn't matter if you have a degree. Um, so it's much more important what you have achieved in your free time than what kind of degree you have. Um, these days, it's actually popular to work in computer science, not after you didn't finish a university program, but after you um, did a computer science boot camp. These things are crazy hyped in Silicon Valley. You go into this boot camp for like three months, some going longer, six months, and you get a like every day, full day education in computer science. And at the end of it, um, you can actually work in computer science, and it's pretty successful. So that's another way to go. Um, but still, I don't want to say that studying computer science is not worth it. Studying computer science gives you an advantage because it gives you a very broad knowledge. When you did go to university for computer science, you can adapt a lot more to different surroundings. Um, you can learn programming languages a lot faster if you once understood the foundations of computer science and the foundations of programming languages. So um, somebody who studied this stuff would probably able to switch between uh, programming languages very fast. So you can go from one company to another company, switches to set and to mind. So that's a little harder if you just, you know, learn on the job. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's, it's possible. So studying computer science is still a great thing if you're interested in it. If you actually care about computer science, if you want to learn about math, if you want to learn about algorithms, do it. By all means, it's great. It's interesting. But, um, what I want to tell you that um, you don't need to be a computer nerd since kindergarten to be able to learn computer science. Not at all. Um, if you never touched a computer before, it doesn't matter. You all have uh, exposure to computer science in terms of at least phones or your tablets or whatever. So that's enough. If you really want to get into it, that's fine. You can do it. You don't need to be, um, yeah, this, this nerd has been doing this forever. I have fantastic colleagues at my work who did study law before, who actually became a retail salesperson before, it doesn't matter, they're still great programmers um, in their everyday job. And even if you're 30, you're 40, or you're 50, you can still start to work in computer science. Seriously, there are people who did it. Um, and also this one is pretty, oh my god, it's always switching like two slides. Um, this one is pretty important. You might think that only people who live in large cities can work in computer science, and that's absolutely not true. Actually, computer science is one of the few less um, jobs that you can do from anywhere in the world. So these days, there are a lot of companies who actually do completely remote work. That means they don't have an office anywhere. They have, might have a couple hundred people distributed all over the world who don't have an office because they do everything remotely over the internet. So um, as long as you have internet connection and as long as you have a computer, you're good to go. You can work everywhere as a computer scientist. And this is a pretty, pretty good thing some people even take it to the extreme and travel while they work. So they basically travel, I don't know, they take a car through Australia for a year and work on the side. So they set up their car and they work eight hours a day and then they drive further. And they call themselves digital nomads. And it's actually a pretty popular lifestyle these days. So but don't think that just because you're not in a big city, uh, you can't work as a computer scientist. It's completely not true. <clears throat> So this is also the, the 
first, so you saw the title, the title is No Pants Needed, right? Maybe asking why I said that or why I put that on the screen. This is one part of it, because people who work in their own environment, like in their own office, in their own room, back at home, um, they don't actually need to wear pants. And it's uh, like, it's funny cliche about computer scientists, they like to sit at home without pants at work. You know, it works and it's not really false, but it's also not really true, it just depends. But this is just part of why I choose this title, so um, I'll get back to that later. Um, yeah, this is also, this is what I'm talking about with the, the pants. I'll just give you a second to do that. It's actually very interesting. So this is one of the risks. more truth to it than you really want to know. Um, so another thing that you might think about computer science is that you need to be male, you need to be not disabled, you need to be white, you need to be straight to work in this field. And all of these are not true, again, probably guessed by now. Yes, unfortunately, computer science is dominated by men, it's true, there are less women in computer science, but there are and have been great women in computer science. Um, starting from actually the first computer programmer today, and we say that we actually talk about uh, a woman, Ada Lovelace, in the 1840s. She actually wrote the first computer programs without having a computer by then. She just theoretically um, created programs on paper. <coughs> Grace Hopper, she was the first one to actually create a compiler. It's like a translator for computer languages. Um, Margaret Hamilton, who helped bring us to the moon, uh, she wrote the code for the Apollo program, um, so we wouldn't have been on the moon without her. And just recently, this year, Katie Bauman, I don't know if you saw it, she's like 29 or 30 years old, and this year she was everywhere in the news because she wrote the algorithm to stitch together pictures from the first black hole that we could observe in the universe, and she wrote the code for it, so there are fantastic women in this field. Um, also, your looks, your gender or whatever doesn't really matter. Proven by the fact, um, when your skin color doesn't matter, proven by the fact that actually India and China are completely dominating this field. So um, if there were a problem with other skin colors in computer science, then you know people from India and, and China would have a lot more problems. But if you go into computer science, you will notice people from India and China are completely dominating this field. They put a lot more effort into it. They put a lot more money into it. And just, I think we've got to accept it. And also, this is, this, it's, it's cool. These are great people. You will, if you work in computer science, you definitely will meet people from other nations, from other backgrounds. And that's one of the greatest things about this, about this uh, discipline. And this is where the second layer of my title from this talk comes in. No pants needed, as in, you can wear a skirt, you can wear a dress, you can wear a traditional uniform, you can wear whatever you want in computer science. It doesn't really matter if you're wearing pants, if you're male, whatever. Um, we take everyone in computer science. This one is also popular, that you need like newest gear to work in computer science. Like you need a fancy MacBook, and, you know, maxed out and whatever. It's not true. Nobody cares about what kind of computer you have. It doesn't matter if it's a Windows system, if it's a Linux system, if it's a Mac system. Nobody cares as long as you write good code. You can take a $200 computer, or you can take even further, there's these days, there's things called single board computers, you may have heard of it, it's called Raspberry Pi, it's like this tiny thing, uh, it sets you back about $50, and it's like a full-blown computer. You can develop on this thing, no, no problem at all. So you go buy a little thing of hardware for 50 bucks, you need a monitor and the mouse and the keyboard or whatever, but um, then you can start. So it doesn't really matter what kind of hardware you use or you have. Um, and one of the reasons why computer science is so open and liberating with all these things that I just told you is we got a special weapon. Um, we got a special weapon that no other discipline has, and this um, weapon is called open source. Um, and this guy is actually using his pants, that's what I thought I was getting. Um, and open source is a mindset of sharing that um, is very prevalent in the computer science space. Um, it means we share the source code, the product of what we do in computer science, the, the 
product that we create. Many times we just share the world for no cost at all. Um, you will probably know some open source projects, like you all have heard of Android on your phones. This is mostly open source software uh, based on another operating system, Linux, or you might use a browser called Firefox. Or you might, I don't know, have sometimes created a blog in your life and you probably use WordPress. All these are like open source projects that are great examples for collaboration um, and mindset within computer science. So you put something and you put your source code online and if people like it, they will use it and it can become viral just like a YouTube video. So if you look for, I don't know, the newest TikTok stuff or something like that, and you know, the video explodes, that stuff happens in computer science as well. Sometimes, you know, people create a small piece of code that's just genius and in a couple of weeks a thousand developers in the world will use it just because it's open source and they can use it. So, Open source enables everyone to become a successful programmer, and all that counts is your code. Nobody looks at your face. You don't even have to put a picture of you there. It doesn't matter if you're a dog, because there's actually a saying that nobody knows you're a dog on the internet. But, so you could be anyone, as long as you write good code and you put it up for everyone to use, you can become like a you know, little famous in the computer science world. Um, and open source really shines for smaller components. The big ones that I just mentioned are just like some very bright, um, projects, but actually open source happens in, in a smaller space. So when I work at my work, when we build something, we don't start from scratch. We don't write everything from scratch. We take parts that have been written by other people and have been refined and just use it um, and build our own products with it. Of course, we do our own work on top of it, but we would never start from scratch. We just use parts, pick a part there, pick a part there, use a the library from this guy, and we never know who the people behind it are. They might be, I don't know, they might be kids from Alaska, they might be an old guy sitting in Albania, I don't know. It's all possible and we don't really care about it. Um, so, you can make a name for yourself in the open source world really fast by giving back. So, you might ask, so you take all the stuff, but it's kind of an imbalance of taking and giving. We actually give back to open source a lot. That means we contribute to other code that's been out there. We fix bugs, we fix errors, we fix documentation. I actually started out when I got into open source, uh, I started out fixing typos, like little pink typos. There's a wrong, uh, in, in documentation of raw, so not in code actually. I fixed documentation of other projects where they say, hey, this is the wrong word. And that's how I started. And these days, I fix a lot of bugs in open source every day in other people's codes. And that makes me very happy and it's a very cool thing to do, I guess. And it gives you a, a sense of uh, purpose in the world. <clears throat> yeah, so you can start contributing to open source projects right now um, and just start with tiny stuff. You don't, need even, you don't even need to be able to program. You can just look at this and be like, hey, I don't like this image, or this is uh, actually a, a, a tutorial that's not very nice. I'm going to switch it around because I was in a situation I didn't understand it. What can you do better? So this mindset of improving stuff that's already there is very central to open source development and I think to the science in general. Um, so now I told you that all of you basically can work in computer science. I don't think there's anything keeping you from doing it now. And I really mean it. Like every single one of you can work in computer science. That's not exaggerated or that's not a lie. That's the fact. But maybe you're asking why would you want to do this? You know, um, what can you do with computer science actually? Um, and I asked, in the beginning, I asked this question, who of you considered or is considering to work in computer science? And that was actually a little trick question because it has a certain, it had a certain framing. Um, it had a framing in terms of, um, it requires a certain expectation of computer science. It requires this expectation that computer science is just like, you know, you got your disciplines like arts, languages, business, whatever, it's just examples, it could be anything. And you got computer science. So, if you answered the question, you probably had this model in your head and you thought about, hey, do I really want to be in the column or do I not want to be in the column? And what I want to tell you is that it's totally fine, this is not going to change, this is true, you can do that. Um, but I think this is not how computer science will look like in the future and how the, what the future of the, of the uh, discipline is. Um, so maybe um, you can think about another way of how to do computer science. So, again, Maybe think of it more like this. 
this is how I think it will become our future. Computer science will be um, a foundation for all other disciplines. It doesn't matter what other discipline you, you work in, it will be a requirement or it will make you better if you know computer science. Um, so if you think the tech industry is separate to hire computer programmers, then maybe you were right 15 years ago. Because today you are wrong, actually every industry is striving to hire computer programmers. I found a number, it wasn't very reliable, I couldn't find the source, I'm not going to put it on the screen or anything, but it said that 67% of IT jobs are actually outside the tech industry. And even though that number might be wrong, I think the general direction is correct. You don't have to work in computer science to work with computer science. You can work in any other field that you want. And what does this mean for you? It means that computer science doesn't need to be an end for itself. If you want to do computer science because you like math, and you like computer science, and you like algorithms, it's fine, do it. But I'm probably not going to be able to tell you anything new about it. You already set your mind to do it. Um, it's fine. But what I want to talk about is that if you don't fit in this category, you don't actually like math, and you don't actually think you belong in computer science, um, that you can still work in computer science. You don't you love computer science to work in it. It can just be a tool for you. It can help you. Um, look, like, look at computer science like a tool in your belt, you know, that can help you with whatever, with whatever your, your real passion is or you really want to do. And I found this horrible, horrible metallic that I'm not going to tell you anyway. I mean, it's pretty brittle and stupid, but I think it somehow fits. So if you look at computer science like a knife, um, then and you study computer science, you get a very sharp knife in the end, you get like a scalpel if you do surgery with. But maybe you don't want to become a surgeon at all. Like you want to open up a sandwich shop and you don't really need a scalpel. You just need a regular knife. Like every other butter knife will do just fine. And this is kind of representing, I think, of how we should look at computer science. It should be a tool and it should not be an end in itself. If that's the thing. If it's an end, if, if you want to have it as an end in itself and you think, you know, it deserves its its uh, spot, then that's fine, you can do it as well. But all the other people, computer science does not need to be the center of your life if you do it. You don't need to identify as a computer scientist. You can identify as whatever you want and still work with computer science. So this is what I'm trying to make you take away from today is do computer science plus X. You can be something else and work in computer science. You can be a lawyer and automate all the same stupid letter that you send out every day. You can automate it. You can be a farmer and use a drone computer vision to change crops that you put out in your fields. You can be a politician and digitize the way your government works so you save money and paper and become more accessible to other people. You can be a journalist and use web scraping and data visualization to prove your opinions that you put out. You can be a blacksmith and use digital 3D modeling to simulate and optimize, optimize <coughs> the pieces you create. You can be a teacher and create animations, movies, or website about complex topics that you teach in school. It doesn't really matter. So, the last thing that I want to answer is how can I get started? Because maybe some of you are thinking, oh, hey, this actually sounds kind of useful. Well, how should I start that? Um, there's a couple ways to do that. First thing is the Elite Academy, that uh, the guys over here who are organizing this, you can sign up online for their courses. They actually do classes here in place. Um, you can obviously go to the universities here. That's fine if you want to study that and get a degree. Perfect. Um, or you can go online and start teaching yourself. Um, there's a couple of places you can do that. For example, I wrote on Code Academy, Udemy.com, CS50, which is like a course by Howard University. Or you can just use Google and YouTube. You're not stupid. You know how to use it. Um, you look up everything on YouTube. You can look up on YouTube how to learn whatever you want to do in computer science. So this is it. Um, to get back to the talk title, you can work in computer science. It doesn't matter if you're spirit, pants, or whatever you want. Thank you.
thank you very much, Robert. Uh, any questions uh, in this direction? No, but you're here for lunch break, yeah, so of course you can approach more staff. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. So, uh, the, the digital morning will continue with the uh, uh, topics. Creativity is next, uh, and uh, before lunch break, the, the last uh, presentation we have, and the pre presenter is Georges Weller. He is a founder of a company called Evolvet. Uh, it's an agency for digital transformation, and uh, the topic of this presentation is your future is disruptive. Let's make a change. So let's hear it. Georgia? Hello, everyone. I need to excuse myself um, like Moritz before. We had some technical difficulties and I need to read most of the part from my smartphone. So please excuse. We talk about future. Promising jobs or things you can 
do what, where can you find the best value with the solid future perspective? To answer these questions, we need to take a brief look into the future. And many scientists and visionaries and economists had many ideas about future living. Since the beginning of intelligent life, the mind was always directing into tomorrow. In the 1920s, people thought we were flying with wings through the air, dragging, uh, traveling through the ocean with the wheels that drag us through there, or flying in UFOs around. Okay, this is not far away anymore because we saw we have already flying. Each decade had its own visions, depending on the knowledge they had at this time. You see, at this time, Star Trek from the 60s, 70s, they could travel to the end of the galaxy. They used laser guns to kill aliens, but they couldn't imagine things like touch screens. So why do I show you this old stuff that you only can smile about or that uh, we already know because we have such a high technology state? Well, while people in the past had their limitations to think decades ahead, we are facing some more profound visions that may sound a little bit uh, overconfident now, but all the predictions I'm going to show you seconds are uh, either already in development or are planned to be developed or are just extensions of what we already know from today. So by 2025, predictions say that we don't use these smartphones anymore, but we have more integrated devices like bracelets. Today, many people already use smartwatches, so the next big step is not that far away. Instead of using smartphones, we can also use augmented and virtual reality glasses. These ones are quite big, of course, but uh, technology is rising, so they can become smaller than the Google glasses we already know. And Oculus Rift is already some years on market, so it's not that far away. And in surgeries for doctors, the Microsoft Bullets that the doctors wear. Let's go a step further. For 2050, the analysts say that we are going to connect our brain to the internet. It's crazy, I think. I mean, um, just instead of uh, using your fingers uh, to tap something in, you just think and somebody will get this message. Or something amazing with that just by thinking. Volvo Vera. This is a truck that doesn't need any driver anymore. It's not a vision they are going they did it right now. It is in development. It's a level five truck that means it doesn't need a driver and is autonomously driving completely without any people. That's why they don't even have these Cabin here anymore, there's no space for a driver. The prediction says <coughs> that we don't own our own cars anymore, but we will use the cars of our people or public available ports. This is one. You just jump in and they drive you. Printers. 
nechci vidět. They are cheap and they build things fast. A complete house is not a large part. A complete house in 24 hours for four thousand dollars. In the video behind me you can see that they use concrete to print so they are also plastic that can be 3D printed like that. How many materials do you think can be 3D printed? Any number? What was it? Hundred? Thousand? This is much over 300. Over 300 materials can be printed with 3D printers. More than concrete, like that. Less metal. And the mask is to is planning to take one of these 3D printers to the mask to build the structures, the houses they need on the mask to live in, to print them. Why not? For now, it's a split basically it's just a split house, but um, the technology is evolving. So Maybe we will build the next skyscrapers in the next 10 to 15 years with that. Another important thing that can be 3D printed are human cells. We can actually print things like organs, stomachs, livers, hearts. In Tel Aviv, they have printed a heart, a fully functional heart, with a 3D printer. It's not ready for transportation yet, but it doesn't need much time until you don't need to have organs or black market organs or you just free to print them. Artificial intelligence, making machines intelligent. Today it uses already in our daily life. You have um, for example these assistants here like Siri, Alexa or other ones. And these machines become better and better every day through machine learning. Scientists say that by 2015, the machines, the artificial intelligence, will be smarter than us. In 2017, the Stanford University has published a study that described the successful use of artificial intelligence to detect skin cancer. They published a study against examples to come in the future. And um, if you're interested in learning more about these visions and predictions, I recommend you to take a look at this website. It's from Kaspersky Labs, the antivirus, antivirus software developer. And they have created this nice page. See some smartphones, you can take a picture if you want or make a note. Life is evolving, it's amazing. Breaking down Moore's law, a very basic statement, the capacity and the power of computers will double every two years. And so does our life. We are moving with light speed. Each big step in chemistry brings new requirements and challenges for life and work. In the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago, people needed to replace their work in small shops like this with the one at the assembly lines. This revolution mostly ended the era of small handwork and enabled fast mass production. So, what does it mean for you? The IAB Institute in Germany says that in the next Case, 70% of all jobs are at high risk. Jobs from the production segment will be replaced by automation and robots. 
the study from Trade was born estimated also of 47% of all jobs in the USA for the next decades. In China, it is 77%. The price waterhouse Cooper was taken the same. And the OECD says that on average, 57% of all jobs. Maybe some of these jobs, bakers, farmers, bankers, all kinds of financial jobs, call center operators, warehouse workers and lawyers. That doesn't mean that they will be completely replaced, but what these basic work that they do can be automated, that will be automated. And only the things that need this let's say, a um, higher brain level work, they will stay. It's also sounds a little bit scary, besides, but besides these bad things, of course, uh, some good news. Because for all these jobs that will fall apart, new jobs will appear on the market. We don't know yet what these uh, kind of jobs will gonna be yet, but it will be jobs that share some specific characteristics. For example, they are automated. They can't be replaced by machines. They require human abilities like creativity, consciousness of mind, the soul. Or they possess and shape all these digitalization things. Or they are in the machines. The digitization has changed the development people going around and selling things need to improve their way of selling with more efficient tools like marketing instruments, online marketing, because it's knocking on doors and selling things from the doors that doesn't work anymore. They need to spread the market. Today, lifetime learning is not a keyword anymore for motivation. It's an absolute doesn't mean that you have to memorize the whole Wikipedia, but uh, that you go through the world with open eyes and keep your creativity and curiosity on the go again and again. And don't start in laziness. So, how to do it? Let's move on. The future is digital. The life is digital. Everything is digital. There's no business field. No living area, nothing that you can live without IT. The whole world is connected. So basically it would be nice to do something in the digital area. Why IT in general or developing? The question is, is, um, is it easy to learn that? Is it easy to learn developing or programming? digital or IT. Not easy to answer, but um, because many people have uh, different, everyone has different talents or um, uh, another learning curve. But on the other hand, I wanted to answer this question and I made a test and tried to teach my son, okay, not that small, but it's not this much, how to do coding. Starting with this uh, educational and visual programming language Scratch, he immediately gained nice results. And by the way, he's five years old. So the answer is yes, it's very easy. We 
it's easy for us. It's to learn something by today has never been easier, no matter what you want to learn. Never before in human history we had access to so much education and resources. Whatever you want to learn, you can learn. Just imagine 30 years ago, there were was not the, the internet, and now we have Wikipedia. We have Wikipedia storing the entire knowledge of complete work on our website. We have online academies at Udemy where you can get professional training in each field, not only IT, in every field. And we have the ability to connect person as well through messenger, video, phone, to discuss, learn, and to develop yourself. School is a nice place to learn the basics, but if you want to become a real professional, you need to increase your knowledge by yourself, day by day, every day. Luckily, there are many motivational resources that you can use. These sources are not only for developing, but also for all digital fields that you will need for your future, no matter which job you will do. For example, logic knowledge, basic IT stuff like for Excel is the most basic thing everybody needs to know how to use these things. Or specific fields like artificial intelligence, robotics, nanotechnology. If you want to learn coding, you can visit Udemy. Scratch or smaller pieces, code.org or Almuk, it's an Albanian platform created here in Albania to teach children stuff from different fields in physics, mathematics, IT. When I'm more into the engineering and the electricity fields, take a look at Macro, Arduino, or Lego Robotics. choose a technical direction, or a creative one, or going into consulting, or into medicine, physics, mathematics, or even fashion. There are no limits. Just keep always in mind, how can I improve my work and my field of work with the help of IT? Yesterday I talked with uh, Professor Zolike about Navi. You can drive the big machine, the tractors, all by itself and make it possible that the land is maintained. Or you can be smart and use GPS to let the trucks drive by itself. Some other good news. IT people are highly wanted and needed everywhere in every company all over the world. I don't have numbers for it right now. For example, in Germany, there are 120,000 open IT jobs. And these IT jobs, I showed you before, it's not only coding, it's everything that has to do with IT. So it's a great opportunity to start a career right now in this field. A very important 
So I think what we have now is a very analog, old-fashioned program called lunch break. <laughs> so we see you again at uh, 1 o'clock and we continue with uh, sustainability. So be sure to come back.